From Microbe TV, this is Twin This Week in Neuroscience, episode number nine, recorded on August 10th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from New York City, Ori Lieberman. Hello, Vincent. How's it going? It's going all right, as best as can be expected, with uh, viruses circulating everywhere. <laughs> also joining us from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hi, Vincent. Hi, everyone. Hello again. Also from New York City, Andres Bendeski. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. And uh, we have no um, Aaron today, right, uh, Ori? No, she uh, submitted an R01 and decided not to join us for probably better plans. Yeah, that's sad that we are second fiddle to R01s, post R01 <laughs> celebration. Okay, uh, we have a guest today. I'm going to leave it to Ori to introduce her. Um, so our guest today is uh, Dr. Jenna Waldman, who is uh, an epi fellow here in uh, Columbia and uh, was the chief neurology resident during the COVID pandemic. So um, I thought she might be a good person to have on today um, to talk about COVID and how her experience was. And then also maybe we'll kind of wrap up with some neurological manifestations of COVID. So welcome, Jenna. Thank you very much for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe we'll start um, just by hearing a little bit about yourself. Um, so kind of your training, and I think you're the you're the first real clinical person we've had on. So maybe just um, kind of talk to people about residency fellowship and we what the stages are of clinical training. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I went to medical school at Rush Medical College in Chicago. Um, and uh, medical school is traditionally four years, unless you're an MD, PhD, which or yeah, <laughs> that you are, well, and or then, a sucker for punishment. <laughs> is the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm on year eight. So. <laughs> yeah, and then it's a, a little bit longer. It's broken up into classroom work and then clinical work on the floors, uh, where you rotate through um, all the kind of areas of medicine, and then residency you choose. Um, a specialty medicine, surgery, OB, and so I chose neurology. Neurology is a four-year training program, um, and I did that here at New York Presbyterian at Columbia, um, and then uh, the chief residency year is an administrative educational position that is different depending on which specialty you're in, um, and here at Columbia, it's a year where you're an attending physician, so you're in the faculty practice um, and you're also uh, kind of the leader of the residents, uh, advocating for them in, in charge of their educational programming, as well as seeing patients and teaching the residents and med students. Uh, so it's a one-year position, and now um, I'm on track to become an epilepsy specialist. So it's a two-year fellowship of training in the epilepsy division, after which my long years of training maybe will come to an end, um, and I'll become an attending physician. But it never ends. You're always learning. Me. Yes, yes. It always continues. So you will end up at some academic medical center, right? Yeah. And uh, so Columbia's pretty good in neurology, I understand. Is that correct? Yeah, we're pretty good. I think, you know, the U.S. News and Report just came out. We always get a good uh, report card from them. Um, mm -hmm. But it is a, it's a great place to uh, learn neurology. Absolutely. Yeah. So did you... Did you know you always wanted to be a neurologist or how did you come to that kind of conclusion? Um, yeah, through before medical school, I had some exposure, actually a, a different route, but in like sports medicine and athletic training. And that led me into some um, exposure into more of the rehabilitation world. And that was my first exposure to stroke patients and seeing um, the manifestations of stroke and recovery. And then it was during my clerkship rotation as a third year medical student where I got to see really neurology for the first time outside of the textbook. And I realized all the things that interested me along the way, um, both the neuroscience aspect and the clinical aspect really manifested itself in the neurological patient. Um, and so then from there, it was neurology all the way. <laughs> I have a neurology story for you at Columbia. I've been, I've been at Columbia since 1982. When I 
I came, I was working on polio virus, right? So I was interested in the nervous system. And I started a collaboration with a, a guy who's no longer there, Jim Miller. He used to work on uh, a mouse model of polio, and he was teaching me. I was working with him. And at one point, my chairman said to Lou Rowland, right? He used to be the chair of neurology, famous guy, right? You probably, yeah. everybody knows the name. So my chairman said to Lou, give uh, Rack and Yellow a joint appointment. It would really help. And Roland said, nah, polio's finished. We know everything we need to know. I'm not interested. Still working on it to this day. Lots of problems and lots of interesting stuff happened in, subsequent to him saying, you know, it was finished. So never say anything is finished. That's the that's the moral of the story. <laughs> but I always joke about- here on, on Twin, I'm the guy who destroys the central nervous system with my viruses because my, huh. my viruses actually reproduce seem to reproduce <laughs> in neurons and astrocytes and so forth. <laughs> Where are you from originally? Are you from Chicago? I'm from California, Northern California. Okay. All right. And then how did you decide on epilepsy? I'll mm. just ask one more question. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, it was something I discovered along the way. All of neurology interests me. I, I think I thought about going into every subspecialty along the way. Um, and the more I got to see how epilepsy really localizes when you get to see some of the stereo EEG cases where we have the intracranial electrodes and the semiology um, was very fascinating to me. And then as I got more comfortable in kind of the outpatient clinical setting and helping someone really manage their epilepsy for many years, get through pregnancy and and gain seizure control and what that does to someone's quality of life um, together made me really interested. You get that exciting aspect that, you know, as a trainee, when you're dealing with emergencies, um, it's exciting to be competent with emergencies and deal with them. But I, I really found a love for that kind of continuity of care that comes with some neurological diagnosis, specifically epilepsy. Um, and it's really just fascinating uh, some of the interventions we can do, especially surgically and understanding the semiology and the localization that goes along with epilepsy. Is Columbia particularly good at epilepsy or... Um... Uh, what is she gonna say? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> what do you want her to say? I would say, say we're particularly she, no. good at all aspects of neurology. Oh yeah, I was gonna say. So there's no, yeah. there's no particular yeah. area of uh, specialty that's the, it's all good. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Right. Columbia is really the best. So yeah, it's the oh, best. God. It's God, really it's the God. best. Uh, <laughs> so who's number two in uh, neurology besides Columbia? <laughs> I'm just curious. Uh, Hopkins. Yeah, there's a lot of great <laughs> institutions for clinical neurology out there. Ah, Hopkins, yeah. The spot yeah. right as she's applying for a job. Uh, so actually, yeah. I, I uh, work on acute flaccid myelitis caused by viruses, and enterovirus 68, as you know, is causing yeah. it. And uh, Carlos is at Johns Hopkins. I forgot his last name, but he's the head of the AFM consortium. Um, that was actually the uh, the clinical case that was presented at uh, my interview day here, we always do, it's called morning report where the residents present a clinical case and it was it was a case of acute flaccid in my life. I remember. Yeah, there's a neurologist here. I can't remember her name. I think she's on one of your papers. Um, but Karen she, Thacker? Yes, yes, exactly. She's particularly yeah. interested. I've talked to her and we're waiting for the next outbreak because we would like to do some virology with her specimens, you know. And so there's supposed to be one starting this month. It's every two years starting in August. And we're wondering if it will not happen because of the distancing and, you know, sort of, that sort of thing and kids not interacting as much. We'll see. I'm, I'm going to put in a plug for University of Utah because we've got um, <laughs> the uh, one of the best drug discovery epilepsy labs in the world. So I think they've had, they've had continuous funding from the NIH for the last 30 years. I Something like half or half of the anticonvulsant therapies or drugs that come out mm. on on the market have come through Utah. So that's my plug. <laughs> we should any other advertisements? <laughs> <laughs> that was the sponsored part of the show. Yeah, we don't get paid. Um, we don't get paid, worry. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to have you on, Jenna, to talk about what. Um, 
kind of COVID was like in the hospital here. Um, so maybe you could start by kind of telling us like the early, like your, your first memory of kind of like recognizing that, oh, this is going to be a thing that's going to change the way medicine is being practiced or we, the way we live our lives. Yeah. Yeah. I, it seems like a long time ago, um, but it was really only, um, you know, end of February and March is really when it hit um, New York, I feel like in a real way, you know, we had been on the news and we had some cases, but then um, at the, you know, in March is really when everything changed in the hospital. Um, it was, you know, a fearful time. We didn't know that much about the virus. We're still learning about the virus um, now, but certainly we know a lot more about, you know, the expecting presenting symptoms and some of the clinical course. Um, but at that time, we really didn't. Um, as well, as we all know, there was the national shortage of personal protective equipment and the need for it um, in the hospital and how that the recommendations changed. You know, in March and the beginning of April, it was hour to hour, day to day, you know, we were getting new information and the hospital was changing their policy and, and updating it as, as we got to understand things more. So it was really this time of uncertainty. Um, but at the same time, I certainly feel like New York really came together by um, really everyone um, following the rules of staying at home. Um, you know, you would walk around in April when I would go into work and there was no one, you know, no one around. The streets were empty. Um, the subway was empty. And in the hospital, um, you know, we changed the way we practiced in that everyone was treating COVID patients. You, you no longer had your surgical floor, your neurology floor, your cardiology floor. You know, COVID was on every floor in every room. Um, and I'm sure you guys heard on the news and our anesthesia department, I think, published an editorial in the New England Journal around that time, how we changed our ORs to ICUs, we needed to like triple our ICU capacity to help take care of them because they came in and just a lot of the people got really sick really fast and respiratory failure in a way that they became ventilator dependent. Um, and so there was really this time in March and April when we were dealing with a disease we knew very little about. You know, was it going to act like other um, coronaviruses, whether they're going to act more like influenza. Um, and we had a limit on, you know, ventilators, on renal dialysis machines, on PPE that, you know, made it this really difficult balance of getting, you know, acute care to everyone that needed it. Um, across New York City and Columbia was no exception. Um, residents who are supposed to be, as I said, I was a neurology resident for four years. I was supposed to just see neurology patients. My residents were supposed to just see neurological disorders, but everyone had their kind of training put on pause mm. and we were all put on COVID teams. Um, and so on the one hand, we really all band together and stepped up and dealt with this pandemic and emergency in a really unified way. Um, but it had a you know big impact on a lot of uh, doctors and nurses and PAs because it was really difficult. You know, families couldn't be at the bedside, and you know, patients were critically ill and dying, and they couldn't have their families there. And we were learning along the way. Um, I think it came out of our university as well. The you know steroids at first were contraindicated, and then they were. And they were, there was evidence to support using them. You know, it, it, we were really living in the moment of, of science coming out, of, of um, evidence coming out. And as we learned more, recommendations changed. What point did, so, um, did, did it become clear that these patients had neurological issues? I'm sure that wasn't something you thought of initially, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was... It was interesting because certainly when it first started in March, definitely the focus was on the respiratory symptoms um, and the need for, uh, you know, ventilators and then multi-system, you know, organ failure. Um, but then there, you know, our consultation service remained, you could say, open for business, right? We had people on there that were still just answering neurological questions, um, where the first kind of editorial that I published was a 
about how the department kind of reorganized in response. And we really scaled down who was in the hospital and what we needed. But we found that, you know, our uh, acute strokes and our stroke service kind of remained uh, um, not at its peak busyness, but there are still people having strokes and there's um, you know, literature to support is it's a prothrombotic disease with the cytokine storm. People were coming in with acute stroke syndromes. And then a variety of other encephalopathies, encephalitis, um, and, and a different spectrum of diseases. Um, one of my, our colleagues here also, I mean, I think a few people have now published some reviews and cohorts. It's still, you know, a variety of neurological manifestations, it doesn't seem to be a unifying diagnosis, like you were saying, acute, you know, myelitis in the enteroviruses that are polio-like and have a very clear clinical presentation. Um, And I think that is still yet to come out with this, but it does seem like there is some, you know, neurotropic aspect to this disease. There is some uh, neurological manifestations um, with the you know, acute necrotizing encephalitis. We see on the MRIs, it's kind of the thalami and some of the deep brain structures symmetrically that are being involved. Um, And and we certainly saw a few cases that um, were suggestive of that um, during it. So I think to answer your question a little bit more directly, when we still got consults for prolonged encephalopathy that didn't fit the clinical picture of just acute pneumonia, when we got still consults for weakness and stroke presentations, um, they certainly were still present during um, during even the peak of the t- pandemic in April. Mm-hmm. So, and w- what are the main differences you neurological manifestations you saw with this uh, disease with COVID that you don't see with other se- severe ac- respiratory diseases like flu or other types of pneumonia? And there's things that are unique that you that you guys have never seen the neurologist or yeah, I think that, you know, we were seeing people in a prolonged coma that wasn't what we were used to seeing in some of the more um, influenza respiratory failures. And I think that it's certainly multifactorial. These patients got sicker with a cytokine score, storm and multi-organ failure in a way that some of the other, you know, viral mediated pneumonias, I think, don't always happen. Um, you know, something that will be interesting to see, you know, if we have a rise again or as just a small number of these cases persist, certainly in March and April, we had a lot of drug shortages. So the drugs that were needed to adequately sedate the patient so that they could, um, you know, work with the ventilator and have appropriate pressures and um weren't sometimes our typical ones and some that are more long acting. So, you know, something we saw, it was just, I think it was seven or eight patients that I put in that coma board, which I think, or you had some questions for me as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we were seeing that they were in staying in the patient system for a long time. And it really just was taking a lot longer for patients to recover. So as clinical neurologists, we often get consulted for prognostication and, you know, to determine the future, which we, we can't, and we can't always predict someone's survival. But we saw that sometimes people with time actually did improve and, and did get better. Um, and there was certainly um, a large impact of the sedating medications that was required to keep these patients stable and alive throughout their critical illness that did impact uh, their, their neurological presentation. That, right, isn't a direct effect of the virus. So I think there is still some patients that we're seeing. And the question is, is there direct neuroinvasion or now as we're months out, is there some, um, you know, autoimmune post-infectious inflammatory state? Um, And there are some cases that have been presented on Guillain-Barre type um, presentations. And it seems like the virus is capable of that. Um, you know, in my limited knowledge, which is certainly not as expense, extensive as some other neuroinfectious disease clinicians out there, it doesn't seem to be like there's a unifying clinical syndrome that's coming out of this. Um, but there are some questions of direct invasion versus uh, para 
uh, post-infectious syndrome that, that might come out of it. This is, I think, one of the more interesting aspects of this is that it's not just the neurological symptoms, but so many of the symptoms seem to be non-syndromal. Like there's no one, like why is this virus so uh, variable in the symptom symptomology? I mean, we have, I mean, does, does anyone have an idea of why? <laughs> I think he's asking you, Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in general, I, of course, there's the, you know, there's always the severity of the illness versus um, some people are asymptomatic and not. But but even just what you described in one domain of the neurological symptoms seems to suggest that there's just, you know, a variety of outcomes that could be because of, you know, the, the, the sort of stroke-like aspect of it, so blood blood dysfunction, coagulation, whatever you, I don't know what the, the technical terms are, but, <laughs> um, you know, so it's, so it seems like it's hard to know what's the primary versus secondary effects of the virus, but they, but they all seem to be all, just all over the place. Re related to that, I thought it was really interesting in that paper you wrote on, uh, on the experience of uh, the coma board, right? The coma patients. So if I understood correctly, you described eight patients or at least eight in which you found the cause, but in all eight, the cause of the coma was not directly, or in six of them, it was induced by medication. One was an oxic injury, lack of oxygen, and one was a ur urinary tract infection. That one I found most fascinating, but none of them were like a direct uh, effect of the virus, right? It was either by the medication or maybe you can explain yeah. So, words. you know, that came out of um, us receiving consults and, you know, the, the, the clinical question was, why are these patients still in a coma? You know, you asked, mm -hmm. how is it different than other, you know, mm -hmm. respiratory failure cases of pneumonia? And the ICU mm -hmm. physicians were expecting patients to wake up um, and seeing that systemically yes, their other organs were getting better, their right. lungs were getting better, their kidneys were getting better, but they still weren't waking up even though sedation had been stopped. And so why were they persistently in a coma um, was something that um, the critical care community felt to be um, atypical. Um, and so we were getting these consults and so we decided to set up a tumor board like conference to really have a multidisciplinary approach to this. We had some of our critical care specialists, uh, Jan Klassen, who um, is, uh, you know, is a national um, expert in coma and consciousness. Kieran Thacker, who you mentioned, who is an expert in neuroinfectious disease, as well as our, some of our stroke physicians or neurohospitalists. And then we had our neuropharmacology. Uh, uh, Caroline was a part of it, as well as our neuroradiologists, uh, to kind of look at this from a, a, a multidisciplinary approach. Um, you know, some patients even outside of this small sample that we were that we were able to publish more cohesively. You know, if you have anoxic brain injury, there are certain characteristics we see on MRI, on EEG, and so sometimes those lined up. Um, and then um, a lot of them, though, just had this profound effect. We thought that was really medication induced, and then it was very exciting to see weeks, kind of four to six weeks later when we went back and looked at their chart and followed up that they actually had improved. They had regained consciousness. You know, they weren't probably neurologically normal, but they were awake, they were interacting, they were participating in rehab, and they were certainly going to be discharged from the hospital. Um, and that's quite remarkable when you could see that they, you know, had been admitted for, you know, four to six to eight weeks of which um, you know, over a month of that was in the ICU, which is very long. So, um, so we, we could see that there was, you know, I think why the conference was helpful is the question in itself can be very simplistic. Why is this patient still in a coma? But it really can be multifactorial and it helps to have different aspects of um, neurology look at it to really, you know, take apart that patient to say, you know, why, why are they still in a coma? And then a question usually is, you know, do we think they'll recover? Do they think they'll survive? So the kind of the like the shalt I'm getting about this is that a lot of the neurological symptoms happened in really critically ill patients. Um, were there patients 
patients who came in with primary neurological complaints that could be attributed to COVID. I, I mean, I, I know that there are COVID positive swabs in people like primary neurological patients, but you think yeah. it's just true, true and unrelated? Um, so I, I guess with, with coma, certainly they were in the, you know, the severely ill. Um, and I think a question is, you know, do any of the patients have this acute necrotizing encephalitis from a direct um, invasion um, is something that certainly is being investigated. And, and there's a few case reports that maybe support that that's the case. Um, I think some other kind of who didn't go to the ICU for their respiratory symptoms, but had neurological disease. Um, and certainly stroke is one of them. And, and um, I think, you know, research is ongoing, but it seems to be supported that there might be a prothrombotic state you know, with the cytokine storming that that might be um, associated with that. And then I think one of the more interesting things for kind of a direct neurological presentation would be kind of this autoimmune or post-infectious syndrome. You know, are we going to start seeing people with Guillain-Barre? And we've seen a few um, transverse myelitis. Um, is that something that then is is kind of from you know, the body's response to the virus, kind of like Zika, right? Zika was certainly a neurotropic um, virus. Is it chronic fatigue? You think, is there an explanation? It's also neuroimmune or autoimmune or is it a prolonged cytokine state or is it an effect on nerves or muscles or what do you know about this prolonged fatigue? Many people are reporting weeks or months out of like being sick from COVID. Yeah, I can't say I know directly yet about that, and they haven't come across my uh, clinical practice. But I think that is, you know, very interesting to think about, you know, what happens to the, you know, critically ill that is in a coma and recovers. But then I think some of the patients you're talking about maybe didn't need a prolonged hospital stay, but see these kind of prolonged effects. Um, And I think we still don't understand completely um, why that is. Yeah, there definitely seems to be lots of reports now. These long haulers, they're calling them, where they're they're just unable to to really get better. Um, I mean, I think the worry from the general public is the is you know everyone's so fixated on the death the deaths and the sort of case fatality rate, but what are the long term effects of this, and and how long are we going to be dealing with the aftermath? I mean, from your clinical experience, I mean, you, these are still very rare cases, right, that you're, that they come across. It's not like there's some sort of epidemic that's going to come in for neurological symptoms from people who've survived COVID. I think at our, you know, department, and certainly you can see from papers published, neurologists are really trying to look into see what are the neurological implications of this disease. To me, it seems like there is still on the level of, you know, case series and cohorts of people coming in with neurological symptoms that we think are from, you know, a direct effect of COVID. Um, It doesn't seem to be strictly a, you know, a primary neurological cause, you know, cause of a a cause of a neurological disease yet. Um, So it does seem to be more, I think I agree on the rare side of things. I think there was also some neurological involvement in SARS-1, but much less because that was only 8,000 cases, correct? Yeah. Yeah, SARS. And I think that um, I was I was reviewing before coming on here the, at least an article from my colleagues, Anna Norvig and Catherine Rimmer, that that do a case series and a review of it. And yeah, SARS-1 had some mm. um, neurological manifestations. I don't recall exactly what those were, though. Yeah. Now that it's been several months out, what's the experience of people who had lack of smell and taste, anosmia? Have they all recovered? Do people have a persistent lack of smell? And there seems to be evidence that it's not a neuro or effect on the nerves themselves or in the olfactory sensory neurons. But what's the clinical experience now that it's been a few months? Yeah, I think it's really interesting, you know, because you guys asked me my experience and it was on the inpatient side, right? right. So then wh- when as a neurologist will we see them? after. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they don't have those complaints, then they, mm-hmm. you know, they don't come um, come to their our office. So I can't say I know that from an anecdotal experience with patients 
other than um, some people who I personally know um, who had it and experienced that symptom of which those people recovered and regained it. Um, but that is certainly a very subjective um, experience with that. Yeah. And how, how is the department now? I mean, are like, are, is everything back up to normal? Um, and how are kind of all the residents doing? Like, was this, is this still a tr- like kind of a traumatic experience that's happening? Yeah, I think that it, uh, hopefully it is no longer a traumatic experience. I think people felt different waves of it in April for kind of, it was really like a six week period of time from the last two weeks of March into the first two weeks of May for the neurology residents, at least, um, that there was a lot of trauma that went into it. I think I spoke about the unknown and about, you know, trying to give the best care we could in, in at times some limited resources and the different dynamic of not having families at the bedside when you're trying to have mm. goals of care conversations and talked with them. Um, it was, it was really difficult. And, you know, in, even in someone who goes into critical care for a specialty, you're not doing that 365 days of the year. You're, you're breaking it apart it during your service time, right? Times you're actually on the floor. And, and for about those eight weeks, residents across specialties were, you know, just taking care of critical, critically ill patients, and they were working long hours, um, a lot of night shifts, and so um, it did have a, a big effect. Um, and me, as chief resident, tried to stabilize that in a in a variety of different ways. Um, so you know, it overall, I think, did not impact training negatively in that I think all of my residents who graduated and all of them that will, will experience what they need in neurology to be proficient, um, excellent neurologists. Um, but it was a, you know, a big chunk of their time. And so especially as things started to come back to this new normal, we were emphasizing really trying to make sure they, especially the junior residents, knew the basics, uh, knew what they needed to do to, to be in that senior level role. Um, you know, in May and June, it was this transition of new normal The the number of cases went down, but the hospital didn't quite return to its normal activity. Um, and you know, everything changed. You asked like, how did medicine change? Right. I think how we wear PPE is going to change in the hospital, uh, for the long run. I hope that we can get to a place where we don't have to wear masks outside all the time as just kind of civilians and normal people in the world. Um, Telemedicine, um, I don't know if you guys have had any doctor's appointments recently, but this really changed outpatient practice and how we're utilizing telemedicine. Um, And I think there's some really positive ways that it can help people neurologically with disabilities that have a hard time coming to the office frequently that can have that, you know, that visit at home to make sure they're just having continuity of care and, and only coming in when needed. Um, and so that definitely, those are some ways that I think medicine is really changing. The ORs are back open. We had floor units that turn into ICUs and those are closed now. But from a hospital system standpoint, Hmm. we now know how to kind of transition our hospital in a state of need to, to, you know, react to an influx in critically ill patients in a way that we kind of put together and learned in March and April that now hopefully we won't need to, but if anything else comes along, we will really have the infrastructure um, to, you know, kind of reestablish, uh, you know, a high intensity level on a larger scale, um, if that's needed in the hospital. I assume there's still a couple of, uh, COVID patients in the hospital on an ongoing basis, right? They're not zero. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't know the exact numbers, but, um, to Ori's question, you know, neurology residents, which you are on your neurology rotation right now, I I believe. Yeah. Um, on our ward service, you know, our neurologists are back seeing neurology, our neurocritical care is back seeing um, neuro- neurologic emergencies. And that was kind of mid May into June is when it really transitioned back to the kind of spectrum of patients we see mm-hmm. um, normally in the hospital. Did you see any pediatric so- COVID patients with neurological issues? Um, so I myself didn't specifically, but but we did. Um, what was interesting in New York, uh, 
you know, the Children's Hospital here on the Columbia campus is one of the larger ones. I mean, they, in fact, transitioned to hold some young adults Mm. because of the need. Um, But there were, um, you know, a few patients that um, also got um, uh, critically ill that our pediatric colleagues uh, did see. Um, And I think there was... um, a case of a Guillain-Barre-like syndrome that they they saw in a pediatric patient. And so how has kind of this change affected people who don't have COVID but are sick? So, you know, someone has a stroke, but they decide to stay at home in April because they don't want to come to the hospital. Um, are you guys seeing kind of an influx of patients now with, that are sicker than they would have been on first presentation? Yeah, I think so. I think that a lot of people stayed out of the hospital and it was good. You know, we were trying to have people stay at home, but, you know, I wouldn't know the number, but New York City reported, um, you know, a high rate of people that EMS found at home that had died, Mm -hmm. right? And what was the cause? And was that neurologic or was that somewhere else that there are definitely people that delayed their care in a way that um, is unfortunate. And it was given the circumstances, but like you said, for stroke, we want to encourage people now, even when you see patients uh, in the office, the office and you're telling them about strokes uh, symptoms and, you know, if they have that, they should come in. People are still wor- very worried, you know, with epilepsy, we want to bring people into the epilepsy monitoring unit to evaluate their epilepsy, evaluate them for, for you know, surgical intervention. And there's still a lot of fear about going into the hospital and what that means. Um, you know, here at Columbia, you know, we are safe now and there's areas that don't have COVID and our PPE infrastructure is very well that I do think it's, it is safe and, and you shouldn't delay care that I do think we've seen that where people, I think either unfortunately passed away at home because they didn't seek out care um, or now their disease is in a state that's a little different. On the other hand, we really, you, you know, figured out a way to utilize, um, our outpatient resources in a different way. Um, a lot of people manage their patients through telemedicine in an exceptional way. Our neuro oncologists, our epilepsy colleagues, our stroke colleagues, um, to keep them out of the hospital, our MS colleagues, but make sure that people got, you know, got their care and got, um, you know, new treatments that they needed. Um, it was very difficult, though. It was, a, I mean, it still is a stressful time, but April was really, it was really stressful. I have a related question to other diseases, like many other specialties reported like a decrease in many other uh, manifestations like uh, premature births or myocardial infarctions. You said uh, strokes maybe were happening at the same rate, but were there other surprises about things that went down just because people were staying home, were less active or seeing fewer people get it infected with fewer other viruses or whatever it is that you were surprised that they went down or... Yeah, I think with stroke, the absolute numbers ended up being lower as well. But but we did see stroke presentations at, I guess, a good rate uh, for, for whatever that means. Um, I'm sure there's going to be more papers coming out uh, to specify that. I mean, I think it was that um, balance of, you know, some people, I think our rates lower because people just didn't get come to the hospital and get treated in a way that they normally would. Um, you know, for that span of weeks, the only thing that came through the emergency room was, you know, respiratory and GI mm-hmm. symptoms that were related to COVID. Um, and so, you know, what what happened to people that just, yeah, were having heart attacks or, you know, well, it's, it's, phones or... Yeah. It's kind of like Trump's, Trump's thing about, you know, if we don't test people, there won't be any uh, cases, right? So if, if yeah. we don't report that there's strokes happening, there's no strokes happening, right? But there were certain real things that went down. Like if you are having a premature birth, you're going to go to the hospital, right? And those like people around the world are reporting a substantial decrease in those. But I suppose for other neurological diseases, those are much harder to measure. But I was curious what the clinical experience was, but yeah, more difficult to know. Yeah, I think it's, it's I, I don't think I know the exact numbers. I apologize for that. I no. mean, we definitely saw people you know, our normal rate of people coming in with newly diagnosed brain tumors, new Mm -hmm. onset MS, right? All these diseases, even, you know, the initial diagnosis of ALS can come through the hospital because they, they aren't aware of it. And, and we didn't see those things. 
they weren't coming into the hospital. So is it that they weren't occurring? I, I don't know, or that they right. just hadn't, they delayed yeah. their presentation to the hospital. We, I guess we'll see later if there's a spike when people are more willing to go back to see the yeah. doctor. Yeah. I mean, starting in the end of June and maybe, or you can now comment because you're on the floor. I mean, we're very busy now in the hospital with our primary neurologic, you know, diagnoses and presentations. So um, I, I wouldn't know specifically since I haven't been on the floor in the last month um, is does the history date back to April and May? Um, I think certainly some of them. Yes. So we, we have 17 patients on service now and three of them are new ALS diagnoses that had symptoms like starting in March and April that delayed coming to the hospital or seeing their outpatient doctor. And it like came in in respiratory distress because, and like one lady is, like her diaphragm was paralyzed. So like really, really quite mm. sick. Um, and, and I, I think for the most part, ALS would be diagnosed outpatient. Um, so it's a very kind of inter interesting how things are coming in groups now that would normally not be seen as inpatient. Um, and then to comment on like the number of COVID patients. So I've been now as like on inpatient service for six weeks and I haven't, and every patient is tested for COVID. I haven't seen a single, I saw one positive, like the first day I was there. Mm. And since then, everyone else has been negative. So the rate of transmission or the false negative rate on in our hospital is very, is very high. Well, it's pretty amazing how uh, quickly it was under control in New York. I mean, testament, as you said, to people doing what they were supposed to be doing. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, the stay at home um, law, laws or rules, what started in April, um, there was no one on the streets. Everyone was at home. You know, it was really quite nice at 7 p.m. Everyone in New York City cheered and you could hear it. <laughs> um, and that, you know, was it was really emotional when you got to kind of hear that moment. But, you know, people stayed at home and really followed it. And we saw the effects of that. Um, and then in New York, people are have been really good about wearing masks as well. Um, and it makes a huge difference. Although yeah, I, sure. I a scoop maybe of herd immunity, right? Uh, I think it's not enough. But I have to remind everyone that we had to convince the mayor to close schools back in, what, March. He didn't want to. <laughs> yeah. And that made a big difference, I, mean, I think. He still wants to reopen them. Yeah, I was going to say, didn't they? Aren't they reopening? What's happening? <laughs> as long as the positive rates stay below three percent, well, the governor says five percent, the mayor says three percent, and they're going <laughs> to. Oh open. man! But they're not going to open as they were before. Like, they might be open three days a week, or they might be open uh, in different ways to maintain more distance, wearing masks, and it depends for older kids or younger kids. There's going to be a. It's not all going to be the same. And the universities, is Columbia in person or is it virtual? It's going to be a mix. Some classes mix. are going to be in person. Some are going to be hybrid. Some are going to be only online. Well, some, what are the medical and, students doing, Ori? Are they uh, virtual the first semester? The first semester will be um, will be remote. And, um, huh. like, and then anatomy lab, I think, will be pushed back to the second semester. But then the people that are in clinic will are still in clinic. Yeah, but outpatient practices are still, there's still a large percentage that's being done over the telemedicine system. Mm. Um, and at least, you know, in the neurology department, we're being very mindful of how many patients come into the building per day and at what times, um, you know, to protect them, but also our front desk staff and our ancillary staff um, to to really be mindful of that. Jenna, I think the telemedicine is actually quite... Um, really interesting. I actually have a colleague here who's designed an app that um, takes in a lot of information about um, the person when you ask them specific questions about their, you know, as the as the as the doctor is uh, trying to diagnose it, and then trying to correlate those um, that information using deep learning um, with the eventual diagnosis, and so. Um, It'd be interesting to see how that all comes out, but but I think I had a, I had a consult because I didn't want to go to the, the the hospital either, and I mean it was so much easier. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, for certain things, it's it's almost impossible to to really have a, a full diagnosis through through a, a screen. But you know, I, as you said, I think it's going to change a lot of practices um, for the better. Maybe. Are you expecting uh, an uptick in in cases in the fall, Jenna? 
the school returns? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that the possibility exists, right, as we continue to like reopen. Um, and I think, you know, we don't know, is, is there any seasonal variety? I mean, I don't know what research you've done with the virus now, if, if we know that yet. Um, I certainly don't know the answer to that, um, but, not, I, but I worry not, that... You're not preparing in any way, right? You're just business as usual. Well, I guess, you know, we're preparing in that while the, the hospital is reopening, you know, we have different parameters of um, the way the inpatient is set up as well as outpatient. And so things are not back to normal. Mm. Um, and I think in terms of preparing, um, you know, my narrative on how the hospital responded uh, back in, in April and March, you know, I'd hope we won't get back to how things were at the end of March ever. But if there is an uptick in cases, there is now a different infrastructure in the hospital to um, to be able to take mm. care of an influx of critically ill patients right. um, in a way that, that really wasn't set up before all of this. Yeah, I don't think there's any effect of seasonality. Uh, when the population immunity is so low, that trumps any seasonal effects, although, it, if anything, transmission is better in the fall as it gets drier and cooler. So, But I think the school resumption is going to be the big driver of uh, increased numbers. So maybe we can, uh, just for the sake of time, transition to emails, um, unless we have any last questions. I have one, Jenny, just, you're welcome to stick around. or if, if, if Jen, if you're busy, you can go. But if, I have one more question. Do you, in your opinion, sure. is there any evidence for SARS-CoV-2 getting into the brain? Do you see virus particles or any evidence of virus reproduction in your opinion? Um, I don't think it seems to be the predominant manifestation of the disease from what I've read mm -hmm. and seen, um, although there are people that are more expertise than me. Um, I think that, I don't know if, or if you guys are going to go over that New England Journal paper that you sent me, Ori, but there, you know, there is some work that they are finding some in pathology. I mean, that wasn't overwhelming in that one. Kieran Thacker is the one doing research here mm. at Columbia with our pathology department to look into it. Um, and so I, I can't say that the answer is no, there's, there's no effect, but, but to me, it doesn't seem to be, um, the overwhelming, um, you know, mm. way that the yeah. virus is acting and that it is, you know, exceptionally neurotropic. It doesn't seem yeah. to be the case. Yeah. yeah, this New England paper that, that Ori picked, it's, it's a series of uh, autopsies, right, Ori? Can you summarize that for us? Yeah, so we, um, this is a paper that came out, I guess, now maybe a month or two ago from uh, groups in Boston. Let me just find the author's. So it's a letter in the New England Journal. The first author is Isaac Solomon. And so they they have 18 autopsy cases. So these are obviously patients who died from COVID. So, you know, you're taking the sick of the sick. And a lot of the patients were, when they were, when the autopsy were, were done, were, you know, days to weeks after the initial infection. So the virus could have been cleared. And um, there were essentially like one or two cases where there was some low level of PCR positivity of virus but of course, these are tissue sections that have blood vessels in them. And, you know, if there's RNA in the blood, I, I think that data is still out on whether there is in like a viremia or RNA, low level RNA in the blood um, that can certainly contaminate these, these experiments. Um, and I, Dr. Thacker was the attending last week on service, and she mentioned that they're finding very little, like very little evidence for kind of per, like uh, virus in the parenchyma of the brain. It's hard to pin down because even with uh, Antro 68, where there's a clear association with AFM and there's radiological evidence, right, for virus changes that are consistent. Well, first of all, we don't have any autopsies because none of the kids have died. And uh, only two out of 600, they have virus in CSF even. So it's not a trivial thing to do. Um, and especially at autopsy, you, what you have is it. You're not going to show any reproduction. And if you see particles, it doesn't mean that there's – it's hard. It's really hard. I mean, it was easy for polio because we had hundreds and hundreds of people dying and we had autopsies and we had clear lesions and so forth. But um, 
it's uh, tough for this one, I think. But, I, but it's I, good that the kids aren't dying. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a good. No, yeah. I agree with you. Uh, I agree yeah. with you uh, that uh, I don't see evidence either for, for virus reproduction. I mean, you can take neurons and culture and infect them, but that doesn't mean that it's actually happening in, in patients. I asked Tony Fauci a couple of weeks ago, and he said we just need more autopsies, and that's the only way we're going to find out. So. <clears throat> yeah, that, think... that was a great episode, by the way. Thank you. Tweet. Thank yeah. you. If anything, I think the like post-infectious symptoms. It will be interesting to see in the next couple months if that becomes something that is yeah. that we see more of than you know a direct effect of of COVID nineteen into the parenchyma. I think you, you both, Jenna and, and Jason, you both said there's no there's no syndrome that you would see that if virus were getting in and reproducing in certain parts of the brain, you would see some consistent syndrome like you know west nile encephalitis right or pe polio right. paralysis but you know uh, you know and even the nosmia is pretty it's pretty common but it's it doesn't seem to be um it, it seems to be re reversible in almost all cases so are there any cognitive hey, there are cognitive uh, deficits right in these patients yeah i think especially the ones that are critically ill i mean when they recover from their coma, I think that still begs the question of is it a direct effect yeah. um, or secondary from their critical illness? Yeah. Um, I think reassuring that there are some that even if it takes them longer, still can recover. Um, but the question of you know long-term cognitive effects after being critically ill for weeks to months and in a coma, um, they certainly exist. All right. Um, um, we we have some uh, emails to read. Do you want to stick around, Jenner, or do you want to go back to work? <laughs> uh, I, I'm I'm happy to stick around. Okay. If you guys I love just, me too. Yeah, yeah. Of course. We we yeah, have great. we have listeners who uh, who write in and uh, say cool things. So uh, why don't uh, Ori? Why don't you read that first one from Laura? Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was just because it's very long. Okay. Hello, all. Thank you for a really great show. I was just wondering what I was going to do today as I'm all caught up on TWIV. Then TWIN miraculously appeared on YouTube. Not only that, but the first paper dealt with the visual system. I'm a few years into retirement after a very stimulating career in many scientific fields. No one in my family speaks science, so I have missed the discussions I used to have with my colleagues. The discussions on TWIV gave me a way to focus on SARS-CoV-2 without being petrified of COVID-19. I was also able to catch up a bit by watching the excellent virology course that Vincent teaches. I really love the lecture on virus structure because my PhD dissertation was in the then incipient field of cryo-EM. One of my papers was done with Joachim Frank, who's here at Columbia, and I know the researcher, U.S. citizen from India, who did the rotavirus structure. It is amazing to see how the field has been refined to the point that image reconstruction that used to take years is now done so quickly. My more recent scientific endeavors involved visual or vision toxicology, where I worked with a wonderful team of researchers doing VEPs, which I think are visual evoked potentials, and electroretinography. This is why I was delighted to hear the discussion about transforming glial cells into neurons in the retina and how it translated to the brain. I've avoided CRISPR for years because I've always found proteins to be more interesting than the DNA stuff, <laughs> LOL. So I was happy to hear how CRISPR worked. PTB sounds like a cool protein, but Wiki doesn't have much info on its site. Just a short note about foreign science students in the U.S. My major advisor, a U.S. citizen, is from Hong Kong. The mentor who taught me biochemistry, a U.S. citizen, is from Taiwan. The last visiting scientist I worked with was from Beijing, and since returning to China has, I believe, become the head of the Chinese equivalent of the EPA. Without these people, much incredible research would not have been done the 3D reconstruction of SARS-CoV-2 gave everyone in the world a way to visualize the otherwise invisible threat, a technique that would not have been possible without collaboration between researchers all over the world. Collaborations keep science vital. I'm really looking forward to the next twin. Thanks so much to all the contributors to your channel for keeping, me, keeping at least one aging scientist alive in these crazy times. As both Rich and the Spanish researcher from New York point out, this pandemic is nothing compared to the looming danger of clim climate change. Thanks again, Laura. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for writing in, Laura. And emphasizes what we kind of talked about it in the last episode about yeah. how crazy changing the visa requirements are. Yeah. And they still fall. I mean, they, you know, they reversed it. It was such a waste of time. I mean, they reversed the decision. But in the meantime, 
so many people got stuck or they're still unclear of what what um what enforcement's actually happening so it's just a mess yeah andres you want to take the next one from timothy can you see it there sure let me give me one what about kathleen uh did i skip kathleen sorry yes kathleen sorry (laughs) sure hello tweeners i like that term uh <laughs> hello, Twinners. This, oh, this is from Kathleen. I don't have her last name, but hello, Twinners. Thank you for this fascinating new podcast. I would love to hear an episode on the basics of what we know about how the immune system reacts to infectious infections of the central nervous system. How have humans evolved to handle, say, Powassan virus or herpes encephalitis or HHV6 infection without destroying precious neural tissue? Also, on a practical level, what does neuroscience teach us about keeping brains healthy throughout our lifespans? Thank you for taking the time to share your decades of learning with us. Sincerely, Kathleen from Denver, Colorado, where the weather is always perfect. (laughs) That's not what I hear from my friends in Colorado and Denver. (laughs) That was her comment, not mine, by the way. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Today we touch on some, and we have an expert to a virologist and a viral neuro person. Yeah, I've like seen that, a so. case of each of those. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And there's also there's the, a, uh, sorry, I was going to say, there's also an interesting connection now with the Alzheimer's and, and herpes that's sort of emerging, which I think is intriguing. There, there's a case of a Powassan virus encephalitis on service right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Very, yeah, it's very weird. Yeah, huh. very rare. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. What do you think about that herpes Alzheimer's connection? Jenna, is that something? I, I can't say I know that much about it. I think to All comment right. any further. Okay. If it were, if it, <laughs> take take grams of acyclovir a day, and you'll be fine. Well, apparently there's a trial ongoing, right? Which is grams of well, acyclovir. I mean, my my bias is that I think that a, any neuroinflammatory trigger is going to be harmful and and setting a, setting up a cascade for Alzheimer's. Um, but there was this recent paper that came out as an aside that had this had made this observation that an immune receptor um, had something a variant in immune receptor had something like four times uh, more likelihood of the of people getting uh, Alzheimer's and then they traced it back and, and it's the, it's a receptor that's involved in allowing herpes um, virus inside a cell and so this variant seemed to allow you know basically get rid of this hmm. uh, defense mechanism that would stop the virus from getting into cells obviously no no causality there but I think still another intriguing uh, connection right and I think I think that the HHV6 data in postmortem tissue is a bit is a bit uh, still controversial because mm-hmm. like the sequence, there have been papers on both sides saying that the sequencing analysis is problematic or saying that okay. there's HHV6 throughout the whole brain. So. Yeah, exactly. And there's, and there was some, you know, there've been many studies showing that there's a correlation with fun- fungi that you can find in the brain and bacteria. So I think it's more just an inflammatory response, but yeah. I mean, anyway. <laughs> All right, Timothy writes, Dear Twin Team, firstly, thank you all for your hard work in making such a fun and informative podcast. As a rat psychologist, Twin is a great way to learn about interesting things that I would normally never think about, such as whether it's possible to get my body to make antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 by thinking very, very hard. There are rat psychologists? Wow. Actually, I think Aaron's a rat psychologist. (laughs) Uh, Tim's actually my friend who's a <laughs> neuroscientist. He's a postdoc at NYU. Oh, okay. okay. Psycho- neuro- like psychology and rats, yeah. You should tell him you can't make antibodies by thinking hard. He sh- <laughs> right? Speaking of which, in, in that episode, Twin 7, the, t- the team reviewed a paper that shows that stress can stimulate the spleen via the splenic nerve, leading to increased plasma cell and antibody production. Yeah, that's what he's thinking about. Aaron and Ori mentioned that under certain environments, it may make sense for the body to ramp up adaptive immunity preparedness. This may be especially true for mice and rats because they apparently cannot throw up. Eating the wrong thing, for example, a dodgy sausage that smells funny could mean death. Mice and rats are therefore notoriously careful around new kinds of food such as poisonous bait and will only consume tiny amounts at first, known as food neophobia. 
Maybe eating new food also triggers a stress response such that when it is paired with a small amount of ingested toxin, Botox in the sausage's case, the spleen gets kicked into gear and immunizes the mouth against future poisoning, which would result in an evolutionary advantage. Who knows, but it's fun to think about. It's an interesting idea. Once again, thanks for the wonderful podcast and the interesting discussions. Looking forward to many more episodes. Tim, P.S. The weather here in New York City is brain on fire heat wave. According to my COVID monitoring thermometer, my air con less apartment's room temperature is currently 38 Celsius. Wow. Oof. I would be keeping the thermometer cool by keeping it under my tongue. <laughs> I could have <laughs> just written a page of utter nonsense for all I know. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Kim. All right. So I, I did not know that mice and rats don't throw up. They don't throw up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's why you don't have to like keep them without eating before sur before we do surgery on them. Mm. Yeah. 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 All right, so Jason, I saved the last one for you there. <laughs> yes, you did. I think it's just because you didn't want to say these names, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so this is Andrew from New Zealand. Um, I'm sorry that my accent's not a full New Zealand accent, but I'll try. All right, key order from Pangaroa, my first mi missive to twin. Uh, you asked for feedback, so here it is, and it is a partial response to Sue Ellen's excellent email. I, as ha having only studied biology in high school, can follow fairly well what you're saying in the podcast. However, uh, I've had the advantage of listening to Twix podcasts for quite a while, and that helps a lot. There is another resource that I use and have greatly benefited from are the lectures and videos provided by the University of Twixus. <laughs> Uh, for TWIV, there are Vincent's virology, virology lectures, so there's, there's a link here. Uh, for TWIP, there are Daniel and Dixon's Parasites Without Borders, Parasitic Diseases videos. Uh, for Immune, there are Brianne Barker's Immunology lectures. Have any of you made online basic courses on neurology, or can you recommend any? Um, perhaps Vincent could add the above links to them on the appropriate pages on microbe.tv. They help me maybe, uh, and maybe they'll help others. On Joshua's idea to return home, I'm thinking he's thinking of me. Uh, yeah, you, Jason. Uh, yeah, yeah. On, on Joshua's Jason's idea to return home to Aotearoa, New Zealand, if there is no long-lasting vaccine or treatment in the near future, New Zealand is going to be sitting on a lot of hotels and other infrastructure that we're looking for an alternative use. Tourists are not going to come for their annual vacation if they're going to be stuck in quarantine for a large part of it. I can see a way that some research institutes could re relocate into empty hotels with their scientists who would be able to work without physical distancing constraints. We could become a huge South Sea science park. Uh, we would naturally welcome science educators and establish a block of studios for their use. Um, a pipe dream maybe, but stranger things have happened. Um, now I'm here, Andrew, <laughs> which means, you know, good uh goodbye <laughs> in maori do you, do you used to speak it or you never did no i i mean i'm not a proper kiwi really because i yeah. immigrated to new zealand when i was 14 from uh from south africa but um and so i missed the sort of early it now in in primary school you do have to to learn maori but mm. when i was there i didn't have to learn in high school but yeah we were we were um we were, i was saying i'd go to new zealand because they have no known cases and they don't let anybody in or out so <laughs> it's a pretty safe place to be and yeah. uh they seem politically to be a lot la a lot better than here in the u.s so yes but uh, and it's a beautiful country i mean yeah yeah it's, I, I, not not a lot of bad things to say about new zealand for sure however <laughs> this block of studios this studio is too small <laughs> i want something bigger okay I like the idea of converting a hotel into an institute. That would yeah, be quite that would funny. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be very cool. I don't know of any neurology lectures online. If anybody knows, uh, let us know. Uh, yeah, no, it's a good idea. I should look into that. There are some scattered ones, but I don't know if that's serious on like, all of neuroscience, but they're yeah. for sure some on different topics. We can try to find them, some of them, uh, put some links. All right, that's twin number nine. You can find it at microbe.tv slash twin. And of course, you can subscribe on any podcast player on your phone or tablet. Please subscribe. It's free. You get every episode. 
And do we know who's listening or how many people are listening? If you have questions and comments, they go to twin, T-W-I-N, at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, you know, we have other podcasts, as you've heard, Twiv, Twip, Twim, Twivo, um, Immune. And uh, we do them all. I have people doing them all, and they're all f- doing it f- for free because they love information and disseminating it. So if you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from Columbia University, Jenna Waldman. Thanks for joining us, Jenna. It was great. Thank you. And good luck uh, out there on the on the floors, and hopefully it won't get worse. Yeah. It's a, what you've described is really a uh, experience of a lifetime. These pandemics don't happen very often, right? And so the students and fellows who have been through it, they can probably deal with anything, right? Yeah. It, it, people were remarkable, but it, it probably is a once-in-a-lifetime experience yeah. we just went through. And you would like oh. it to be that way, right? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Ori Lieberman is here at Columbia also on Twitter. He is Ori Lieberman. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, guys. This is great. Andres Bendeski is at Columbia University. He is at Bendeski on Twitter. Thanks, Andres. Great. Thanks to all of you. Perfect. Jason Shepard's over at the University of Utah, which is in Salt Lake City. Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. I'm Maybe v- next time we can get Aaron on so we're not totally dominated by Colombians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And men. Look at this. Look at this. Look at that. You're right. We have all Colombians here, except you. All right. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on This Week in Neuroscience.